We are at the end of talking about um, multi-phase flow, uh, the rates at which uh, uh, transport occurs in the subsurface to multiple fluids. So 2.7 is the last one. And uh, I guess after that, if you look in the, the kind of big picture of where we're going with this, is that we will then, so now we know what this architecture looks like. Uh, we know that it's largely governed by interfacial properties, but the rate at which it gets into the subsurface is driven by um, permeability, and we know something about how to be able to, to, to evaluate that behavior. We also know that in this, um, and if you look at the, the system, that you see that the coloring in this, yeah, you do see the coloring in this, is, is light on one side and dark on the other, so that's really no denoting the fact that stuff is being carried downstream as um, a dissolved component. So right now what you do know, and you, you know you know, Probably bad choice of color, isn't it? Red. What you do know is oh, there's a, there's, a, there's a green already there. I guess I can make it larger. What you know is that you can calculate the rates of fluid transport through here quite straightforwardly through this volume, and you know it's through Darcy's law, and you know it's uh, Q is equal to the cross-sectional area of this downstream face, multiplied through by a relative permeability, which you know how to get, multiplied by the permeability, which we don't really know how to get, and a pressure gradient. And if we know what the volumetric flow rate of water is, then and we know what the, the maximum concentration that can be held in the water is, then we know that the, the mass rate of removal is equal to the volumetric flow rate multiplied by the solubility, which is the concentration. So the concentration is defined as the uh, mass per unit volume. Mass of dissolved component per unit volume of water. And so the products of those two gives us the, the, the rate at which mass is being removed from here and carried downstream. And so we're able to do that now, but it doesn't say anything about um, the distribution of the concentration in this plume that develops. And so part three of what we'll talk about starting next week is to be able to say something about what happens to those dissolved components. So we've talked about free, free phase so far, the role of Capley behavior in defining its architecture. We've talked about Darcy's law written for multiple fluids and what that says about transport through the system. Uh, we're probably most interested in water because those are easy calculations for us to do. Uh, you get an assignment doing this. I think it's assignment number four. It gets you to calculate what the mass loading out of the system is. So I guess that would be happening soon, right? Because they're a week out of step. So due this week would be number three. And next week would be number four. Um, and so uh, you'll ask to calculate that from this, from, from this very simple equation. So that's what, where we're kind of going with this. So today, um, we spend a lot of time talking about relative permeabilities. And we've noted that relative permeabilities relate to capillary pressure versus saturation curves because we can stack them above each other. And we know that they relate to similar behaviors. And so certainly in this, I think we have to go all the, back, the way back to the beginning of this. We've used this figure. Is it here? Oh, geez. Or is it the beginning of these? Perhaps, yeah. You know the figure I'm, well, perhaps you don't know the figure I'm looking for. It's the one where we have the capillary pressure curves stacked upside down and right way up in the subsurface. Perhaps it begins right after this. There. That's a version of it. And so um, 
you know that um, these behaviors are controlled by the capillary pressure versus saturation curves. And it probably wasn't, shouldn't have been lost on you that last time when we were talking about the saturation profiles in the subsurface and what amount of product is recoverable, that the distributions of NAPL were strongly relying on these individual curves. So these look like these inverted curves that we've talked about. And uh, in their simple calculations to figure out how much we can get out, it relies on doing a volume calculation. The simplest volume calculation is the volume of the aquifer uh, and then multiplied by the relative porosities of the individual components. So the, the volume of the aquifer, which would be T minus W times A, multiplied by porosity would be the pore volume in that aquifer. And depending on the saturations that are uh, recoverable and not recoverable from the free product, it gives us an idea of what kind of mass might be present in the system. And these uh, curves are modulated based on the capillary pressure versus saturation curves. And so what we'll do today is we'll just talk about some mechanisms of being able to figure out exactly what those curves are. And we've already touched on some of it. So we will now kind of sit ourselves to talk mainly about unsaturated flow. So it's flow in the Vado zone. And take us two seconds to introduce the concept of matrix potential. Uh, we'll talk again about capillary pressure saturation and relative permeability saturation curves, but not from the theory, but from the idea of the fact that we can have empirical correlations that define those. And these two empirical correlations are named for their originators, Brooks and Corey and uh, Martinus van Genuchten, um, who have uh, developed these methods. So that's kind of where we're going today. So we're talking a little kind of uh, about the uns unsaturated flow, but actually it relates to saturated flow and multiphase flow as well. Because we know that unsaturated flow only has two fluids, so uh, liquid and gas. Gas is air. And um, in the subsurface below the groundwater table, we have water and an apple. So they're just two fluids. One is a wetting fluid, one's a non-wetting fluid, and ostensibly they're the, the same behavior. And so we don't need to actually make any distinction between them. But we will make the concept that we can define these behaviors in the subsurface. And so what we're interested in doing is being able to define both these capillary versus pressure versus saturation curves in an empirical way to say what the magnitudes of the coefficients might be, and also extending that to be able to say exactly what the relative permeability curves would be that complement that. Since we're talking about the, the unsaturated zone, uh, we can talk about the idea of of, of matrix potential, and you've seen this before. This is uh, Bernoulli. This is what we've referred to as total head, H. And it's the sum of pressure head, elevation head, and uh, velocity head. For all our instances, the velocities are so small, and their changes are even smaller from location to location that we throw that away. And then we include pressure head and elevation head in that. Agronomists and agricultural uh, engineers refer to this term as matrix potential, um, just by terminology. So it's just equal to the pressure head, pressure divided by the unit weight of water. And obviously, apples to apples, length, 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 and length. They have to all be the same. And so typically, uh, and we've looked at it already, when we looked at Brooks Corey before, the plots were in terms of capillary pressures per, per unit weight of water, and those are in units of uh, meters, or length, whichever you want to define, and so so, so. so Brooks Corey and Van Genuchten were both dealing with the Vado zones. It was in the time, the late mid-60s, and for Van Genuchten, probably the early 80s, that the emphasis was in groundwater production, and groundwater contamination wasn't really something strongly on people's uh, radar screens. But Brooks and Corey, uh, and we've looked at this already, just to remind you. Ah, geez, it's going to be a long way back. Uh, actually, this is, um, uh, 
Will I be able to tell from this side? Just so you know that we have already dealt with this. Yeah. So we already looked at this. Uh, and so the idea is that we have this curve that looks uh, like our capillary pressure versus saturation curve. We're only showing the, uh, the wetting, it's the, the drying component. It's being dried by a gas coming in and uh, pushing out the water. So it's the drainage curve. Uh, and what we could do is we can transform this by plotting it instead of in terms of natural um, scale for saturation and natural scale for capillary pressure. We could divide capillary pressure through by unit weight and we could change the saturation to only start at this location here and go rightwards. And so we cut off the portion which is the irreducible saturation of water. And so if you define the saturation in terms of an effective saturation, this effective saturation is defined as a saturation of water minus the irreducible saturation. So in other words, if you're at this saturation here, this would be the saturation of water that you find yourself at. Bad English. This is the irreducible saturation of water here. So this term on the top is just the, this length into the figure here. And the term on the bottom is this full length here, one, minus this irreducible part here, which in other words is this blue line. So the blue line here is this term here. And so all we're doing is, we're, you, if you think about it, we're shaving this off, we're making this 0, and we're making this 1. So these, these numbers get scaled in here by some amount. And this is referred to as the effective saturation. If we divide the same pressures by unit weight of the liquid, liquid water in this particular case, and then instead of plotting it on a natural scale, we plot it on a log scale, then when the bubbling pressure here is equal to saturation of 1, this is a saturation of 1 on this axis. Effective saturation here, 1. Uh, effective saturation, very small here. So this is going from here towards this, but it never gets here, right, because it's a log scale. And so this bubbling pressure here is when the saturation is 1, and it represents this same coordinate. As you transfer the, uh, transform the other components of this curve, they tend to all plot on a straight line. And that straight line, the equation of it, is given by this. Effective saturation is equal to the capillary pressure that you're measuring divided by the bubbling pressure, which is a feature of the uh, soil and to the minus lambda power. And the, if you split this up in terms of logs, as we are doing here, then this lambda is just the slope of this curve. And so the intercept is like a, an intercept. This is the intercept uh, of a straight line, but it's in log space. This is the slope of the curve given by uh, a height gamma over one log cycle, which is what this is. And it says a couple of things. It says one, what the bubbling pressure is, which is a fundamental property which you could pull off straight away. And secondly, the inclination of this curve means that if it's very vertical, it would kind of say that as soon as you reach the bubbling pressure, all of the porous medium is invaded. And so if you thought about what that would look like in terms of a um, capillary pressure versus saturation curve, it would kind of look like this. And if it was flat like this, it means that it enters, but you have to add a lot more pressure to be able to get it to invade. So it means the curve would probably look a bit more like this. And so these two different curves are kind of shown here. And this would be squares here and here to represent these different behaviors. So that's all it is. So it's nothing more than that. So see if I can find where I was before. Without taking all day, uh, might do. Might be quite good. I've surprised myself. <laughs>
And so that's what we're going to attempt to, to do now. So I guess I've said most about it. Um, we could define this behavior in terms of uh, an effective saturation, which is what this is. Um, originally, as it was defined, it was defined in terms of volumetric moisture contents. So you remember saturation is equal to volume of uh, the fluid divided by the volume of the voids. Um, volumetric moisture content is defined by the vol volume of fluid divided by the volume of the total sample you have, including the voids in the solid. So the limiting value for this when it's 100% filling the pore space is porosity, as you know. And so defining effective saturation instead of in this, you can divide through by um, uh, full saturation, and it turns out they turn out to be exactly the same relationships. You can write them in both ways. And so the key issue here is that this is the bubbling pressure. This is the slope of this. And so it allows us to be able to define the Capley pressure curve as, a, as an equation, a very simple equation uh, to be able to use in numerical models. But not only used in numerical models, uh, we skipped it, but you can find this in Fedder if you, ever, if you have the book and you ever go back to it. But the whole distribution of saturations in the subsurface, as epitomized in this figure, can actually be calculated by merely taking the equations for these curves and substituting them in to be able to manipulate them, because these define the saturation with pressure and the pressure is also defined with depth. They, pressure and depth correlate. And so if you know what the saturation is with pressure as a, a nice equation, you can determine the saturation with depth as a nice equation. It doesn't turn out to be very nice or very simple, but that's one of the uses for these terms. My main goal here in, in enlightening you about these methods is that they just give you a, a good way to be able to get estimates of capital pressure versus saturation curves and also the relative permeabilities, and relate them to soil that you can pick up in your hand and characterize as a result of that. So we know exactly what the relationship that defines this. This is the relationship. If we take logs of it, it's the, in its simplest form, it's this. And because we can take logs of both sides, the bottom equation is what defines the ultimate behavior. And this defines exactly why it behaves that way. Um, there's no reason we can't divide this through by, since we could multiply top and bottom of this through by unit weight and unit weight, then we could also have this as unit weight and unit weight. Actually, we don't need permission to do that. And so we have a relationship that links effective saturations. This is a saturation of one. This is a saturation of small. A pressure, the bubbling pressure is where the saturation is equal to one and therefore whatever magnitude you pull off here, this happens to be PC zero, right? This would be, we've called it PC zero. This is the water uh, unit weight. And so the implications of this are that if you move from uh, the normal scale to a log scale is that these are the transformations that you'd expect to see. If you had a very steep curve, um, this one number two, I guess, right? That's the steepest of these. So it's the steepest of it. So it means that as soon as you enter a bubble into it, you start drying out the whole system. So number two is very flat, given by this gradient across here, which is exactly what that means. The shallowest of these curves is number four, I guess this one. And not surprisingly, once you get entry into it, it, you have a large change in pressure that you have to apply up here to be able to move it across to change the saturation. And the magnitudes of the bubbling pressures for each of these, clearly the one with the lowest bubbling pressure has to be number one. And clearly the one with the highest bubbling pressure has to be number four. And so it's just an alternate way of being able to represent this. Nothing, nothing more than that. And it allows you to be able to define the, the profiles as we've looked at before. 
So yeah, that, that explains that. So that's one way to be able to define these. And we could use it for what we looked at before. The other thing that we could do is we could try and take these curves in natural space. So saturation or effective saturation versus either pressure or matrix potential here and define what the shape of these curves. We might get some insight from the transformation that we've done here to define this particular equation here. Or we could do it just by trying log, uh, curve fitting. And so the approach of uh, the Van Genuchten curves is by um, curve fitting. And the idea is that you take a curve, and uh, you, the curve might look like this. So this is a, a real curve here. This would be the one boundary to it. So this would be 100% saturated. So by definition, this soil would have a porosity of 50% because this is 0.5 and it's 100% water filled. Um, the irreducible satch saturation would be 20% of that. So this would be 20% uh, irreducible saturation, 0.1. It's written in terms of water contents. And so that if this was the shape of the curve that we want to represent, maybe we can come up with an expression that describes that. And that's really what the approach is. So it's a bit more complicated than we really want to deal with. But the idea is this, is that we can define the behavior of this kind of type curve, either in terms of moisture contents or saturations, because we said that they're relatable to each other. Bless you. Um, I don't. Uh, know which is easier for us to use. Perhaps saturation is because it goes to one and otherwise. And so we can write the uh, equation for this saturation. The equation of this curve is given in terms of this. And so all it's saying is that the effective saturation, remember it varies between the irreducible saturation where it's uh, so this would be effective saturation would be zero and SE I guess would be equal to one as opposed to saturation. So effective saturation would be this because we're subtracting off this this zone here is what we're doing. Doesn't really matter about that. And it's given by this equation, pure and simply. We're not going to try and curve fit it, but it's defined in terms of three coefficients. Uh, alpha N and M. And so it's just a, a curve fitting process that has a curve that asymptotes to this boundary here, asymptotes to this boundary here, and goes through a magnitude of pressure here and bubbling pressure that honor this curve. And the rest is just um, uh, curve fitting. And these coefficients are given as below. And so if I keep the equation that I want to on here, you see that this is not porosity. This is just equal to this value of 1 over 1 minus m. And this value of alpha is equal to some coefficient, which again is defined in terms of m and the bubbling pressure, Pb. And in terms of a physical sense, uh, alpha is equal to 1 over the bubbling head. So if you want a physical understanding of what alpha is, I won't draw it. If we talk about the, the height rise in a capri, which we've called H sub C, this is HB. And so this is the, the height rise in a capri. And I suppose if you think about it in terms of the uh, capri pressure versus uh, saturation curves, it would be given by this curve here. This would be the height of the tension saturated zone. This would be the capillary fringe. So the alpha is not a useless parameter. It's quite a useful parameter. Units of 1 over length. And if you divide, your reciprocal of it is equal to the height of the tension saturated zone. So it has some physical meaning. The other ones are just curve fitting parameters. M and M are just that. And the way to do that is just by a simple rubric of things to do. And so this is the, the, the process, and it's just a recipe as much as anything else. 
you want to define the moisture content which is equivalent to the pressure halfway between the irreducible saturation and the full saturation of the fluid and so in other words it would be equal to this value here which is the residual saturation or moisture content and this value here which is the saturated moisture content so this is 0 0.5 and this is 0, 0 0.1 which is equal to there is residual saturation other way around, which is 0.3. So in other words, the location of this is 0.3, which actually is just this, right? The slope at this point, uh, which you can get, and you do that just by taking, uh, it's a, a log scale, this. I, I guess I should point that out. So this is 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, 3, 4. So one log cycle would be between here and here. And so the intercepts between those would be this. So one cycle is this length here. And the magnitude of F corresponding to that one log cycle is this. Nothing more than that. And the non-dimensional slope of this is this, just F divided by this, this number here, 0 0.5, this length. So the length here is 0 0.5 minus 0 0.1 which is this and then if you have these values if f sub p is greater than 1 which in this case it's uh, uh, no it's less than 1 uh, if, f, if it's greater than 1 then you use this if it's less than 1 which it is in this particular case we use this and so we can get the value of m just by taking this value here and putting it in here. Turns out that the value of m turns out to be 0.5. The value of n is equal to 1 minus 1 over 1 minus n, which if you put this value in for this of 0.5, you get 2. And that alpha is also related to this since we know the bubbling pressure. This would be the bubbling pressure, right? Pb in this particular case. Uh, and so it would be this magnitude here and this term since we know m and these other terms we have a numerical value for those and we have a value of 1.73 which comes out for this this bracketed term and so it's one way to be able to define this curve now the shape of this curve is defined in terms of three parameters one is m one is n and one is alpha. And so if we can define those parameters, then we have a chance of being able to define this curve. And so the, the punchline of this is that if you can define what those parameters are just for a whole bunch of different soils, then you never have to do an experiment because you can expect that you can use these empirical values to figure out the, the curve. That, that's all it is. And so the utility of these are that not only can you define the capillary pressure versus saturation curve, which is what this is, right? capillary pressure or matrix potential or potential head on the vertical axis and saturation or water content on the bottom, because we know that the relative permeabilities are also related to those, then we can perhaps use this information to relate to the relative permeabilities. And so you'll remember that we talked about the fact that what was it? Capri pressures are proportional to 1 over the permeability square root. We didn't belabor it, but I guess we also did say that the J function, if you plot the, the curves for capri pressure versus saturation, that they look like this. J was equal to uh, capillary pressure divided by interfacial tension and multiplied through by permeability and porosity. 
square root. And this bubbling pressure here that we have, P, the, the, the J value for that was J is equal to something like 0 0.3. And we explained the reason that it's always equal to that is because there's an intrinsic relationship between the diameter of our capri tubes and the height rise you get in them and the transmission characteristics of pushing fluid through them in permeability. So capri pressure and permeability are related in some way. And so it seems reasonable that you should be able to use these empirical coefficients to also define what relative permeabilities are as a function either of saturation or as moisture content. And you can do, and these equations here are just given to, to define that. And so the permeability is given by hydraulic conductivity, is given effective conductivity is given by the saturated conductivity, where it's 100% saturated with water, multiplied by some term that represents the relative permeability. So this term here is relative permeability, and it's a function of effective saturation. And you see that this also is defined in terms of these coefficients m, uh, actually only m in this particular case. And in this particular case, it's defined as a function of n and alpha and m. So different expressions that give you that. So it's just a way to be able to define that. And so the final component of this is just being able to uh, define these two relationships I guess it's all put in a, a common language in this um, figure. This represents the capillary pressure versus saturation curve. This represents the relative permeability. It's defined as a function of, we've just transformed these gammas, uh, what we called M and what we called N, not porosity, are now gamma and beta. This is gamma, gamma. This is beta, gamma, etc. And so we can relate um, effective saturation to this. And of course, head would be equal to pressure divided by unit weight of water. Yeah, this would be the capri pressure. And so this is this. So this is the capri pressure versus saturation curve. And this would be the relative permeability versus saturation curve. Two of them that sit directly above each other, right? In terms of these behaviors we've talked about. Relative permeability. I guess it's only just for one limb. It's really just for the, the water saturation. And so this would be this curve here. And this would be This is relative permeability, and this is the relative permeability to the wetting phase. When it's 100% saturated with water, obviously it's 100% relative permeability. And so it just allows you to be able to move between these, because now you have some values for these coefficients. You have them for beta, and you have them for alpha. You have relative limits for saturated moisture contents and residual moisture contents, so this was phi s and phi r that we had before for these different materials and they're all for different soils for very fine grain materials and progressively coarser materials in terms of sandy materials so at least you have a, a fighting chance of being able to determine these these properties uh, merely by linking these these values of these terms i think you have everything you, you need on that slide in that, uh, yeah, so if you know the value of beta and alpha, 
then this, this is not unit weight, but this is a fitting parameter given by 1 over 1 minus b. So you have this. These are the ordinates within your curve for the moisture content that you find yourself at. And these are just the individual defined parameters. And I guess in use of this, this means that in clay, the height of your capillary saturated zone, so if this is the water table, then the tension saturated zone would be a height. Uh, what is it? Um, so the reciprocal of that is that HC is equal to 1 over alpha. And so if these are in values of per centimeter, then this is essentially 0 0.01. So it says that immediately from this, you know that for clay, the height of the, the saturated, uh, tension saturated zone, the capillary fringe, might be 1 over, this is cm, and so 1 over cm to the minus 1 is 100 centimeters, a meter, a meter in other words. And so, so that's what those are useful for. So that gives you some way of being able to figure out exactly what these relative permeability curves are and the capillary pressure versus saturation curves might be from knowing what the material properties that you might pull out of a drill hole in sampling and immediately allows you to construct those curves, which is quite, quite useful. And of course, if you don't, so this gives you a physical link to that. And if you don't have those materials, then you can always use uh, the relationships that we had before. For instance, that we knew that the, the J function in the bubbling pressure could also be written as this term here. So if you, instead of not having any dirt in your hand, you had some properties in a report that describe the permeability and the porosity of, this, of the site, then you might have these. If you have the permeability and you have the porosity and you could get the interfacial tension from a, um, a reference text and you know that at bubbling that this is equal to 0 0.3. then the only thing you don't know here is this point. And so this gives you an absolute reference in terms of this. This would give you PC0, the bubbling pressure, just by doing that. And so those are at least two ways that you could have to, to be able to quantify something about what's going on in your surface. And in quantifying that, you can say things about the height of the tension saturated zone. You can say something about uh, what capillary barriers would act as capillary barriers to stop uh, Dean apples moving. Uh, what supernatant height of those Dean apples you'd need to get through that. And so you can actually start saying something quantitative about the, the system, somewhat different from maybe what you could do uh, three weeks ago. You can do that. So that's all we'll talk about today. So I was going to tell you at the beginning that uh, I, I don't know, sometimes it's uh, more interesting going through these things by, by hand. And I was reminded that if I look at what I did, uh, for some reason we didn't have a class last year. I must have been, I can't imagine I was out of town. Um, but I recall that 2.7 was actually a full fledged hand calculation. So you can run it through it warp speed to see what we've just done today. Same things. We know that we can relate uh, capillary pressure saturation curves and permeability curves, that we know that they say something about the subsurface. We know how to use Darcy's law and what that means in terms of volumetric flow rates. And all that we're trying to do is link magnitudes of um, pressure in the subsurface with properties. And so for some reason, I decided to do it by hand. So if you want to go to that and Look at it, and you're welcome to do that. 60 speed is as fast as it goes, but it's merely just saying what we've, we've, we've mentioned before.
derivations for this, that, and the other. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know all this now. So that's it. So we finished then talking about everything we need to know about multi-phase flow for now. So now we know that we have this chimney, we have these lenses that are present, they're held by interfacial tension, they're not going anywhere. They have an architecture that's defined by those behaviors in terms of capillary behavior. If we have water flowing through that smeared zone and uh, it has a finite uh, amount of denapple in it that reduces the conductivity by the relative permeability magnitude, then we know how to calculate the volumetric flow rates of water through the system. Uh, if we know how to calculate the volumetric flow rates of water and we know how much mass it can dissolve from the denapple, then we could calculate how much the mass flux out of the system is. Um, that would allow us to, for instance, say if we had that continuous flow rate and we're removing it at that rate for 10 years, we could calculate how much was removed. And if we did the calculation, we'd find that the concentrations are so low in dissolved form that it would take decades to do that for any reasonable flow rates. And so now the question that we might want to address ourselves, and I guess that's a video so I can get rid of it, the question that we might want to ask ourselves is that um, what if we go downstream does the distribution of concentrations look like? So now we, we could calculate if we wanted to from this equation here how much mass gets carried downstream but if we look along the length of that plume uh, there'll be mixing and so if there's natural attenuation in the plume that plume will reach a certain length and at the tip of the plume it will kind of come to some homostasis, some steady state where the tip of the plume is zero concentration the back of the plume at the source is the maximum which is here and how do we calculate what the distribution of concentrations along that plume are so the next topic is to look at mass transport to the subsurface and so we have to define another set of relatively simple equations and then use some um, closed form solutions to be able to solve that. So that's where we're going. So that's it. That's it for today.